Hey there, comic book friends. I'm Travis, and this is another edition of No Capes, where I talk about comic books that don't have to do with superheroes, and or Ethan doesn't read them or review them along with me. Uh, first up, we're going to talk about The Massive, issue 16. The wonderful long ships on there. Um, this issue finds us off in the, um, in the um, North Atlantic, in the Iceland, Norway, Finland, that area of the world. Um, Callum and Ninth Wave has um, uh, caught wind that um, a kind of an old nemesis of Callum is out um, hunting um, um, minka whales um, and he's going to put a stop to it. Um, the kind of age-old um, question of the last probably 20 30 years you know is hunting whales murder because of the the um um you know their intelligence and all all that stuff that goes along with that and and the whole um greenpeace and that whole movement that protects um uh, whales in the case of the minka they're not extinct they're not endangered even right now they're on a watch list um uh, in this book after the crash their numbers just skyrocket because um, there's not all the stuff in the way of 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 them continuing to um, there to be more and more of them. Um, Callum, our main character, um, runs uh, basically finds out that a um, Scandinavian man that he that used to be a politician and and not quite a Nazi but definitely a nationalist of sorts. Um, has kind of gone back to his roots and is now hunting whales, but he's only hunting whales for sustenance. Um, you know, they maybe take 10 whales a year is kind of where they're at as far as this community that he lives in. Um, not really putting a dent in the population, really. Um, Callum has some conflict with Mag, the um, third mate in, in, in on the ship uh, because he thinks that, you know, in this new time and whatnot, that they're basically the equivalent of sustenance fishermen, which is, what, of course, what all of uh, Mag's people are and are definitely back to doing um, after the crash. That's how they make a living. That's how they stay alive is by, you know, fishing to eat. Um, and doesn't feel that they should be going to war with this guy, especially when we get the impression that um, Callum is more than willing to um, murder this man to stop... Um, these actions from happening. Um, we find out that Mary has basically jumped ship. We have no idea where she jumped ship at, but she's no longer around. Um, that's interesting. Um, really like Mary. Mary's a very interesting dynamic character. Curious to see when she'll come back. I assume she will be. Um, I, I'm still really enjoying this book. If you've been along this entire run, I bet you you're probably enjoying it too. Um, it, you know, it's thought provoking. It's interesting. It, um, you know, has its own kind of, you know, personal dramas, um, in this aftermath kind of a thing without being incredibly far-fetched or, um, um, over action filled or any of those sorts of stuff. It's just, it's telling a story using some sequential art to do that. And, and I find it interesting. So there is that. Next, we're going to talk about Pretty Deadly Issue 1. Uh, image title, um, lots of talk about this book, you know, partially due to the fact, I guess there's a comic book, um, store, um, that was noted for tearing the book in half because they didn't like it. Um, so there are definitely those people who, um, who do not like the book, detractors. Um, I personally really enjoyed the book. The art in it is amazing. It feels like old school, um, you know, vertigo stuff. I feel like I'm reading a, um, like a, a, a Sandman uh, book or that thing. Even a lot of the story in it has that same sort of a feel in a way. Uh, not to compare it to the Sandman Overture that's actually coming out right about now, um, but just the kind of the ideas that are in it. Um, there is some storytelling within the storytelling of this um, in, in this uh, book that uh, I, I quite enjoyed. Um, it has a fairy tale feel to it in places. Um, it has this kind of legend and lore 
Plus, it's also set in the West, uh, of the Old West. I'm a big fan of the Old West. Um, we've got quite a scattering of characters. Um, this group of roaming minstrels, I guess, is what they are, who um, tell this story of the, um, you know, Jenny, who's the um, daughter of, of death. Um, we get a story inside this about the kind of the... Um, origins of of Jenny to some degree or the 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 storyteller origins of of the character we don't really see the character in this I mean at the very end there's glimpses of of this daughter of death um that if you've read the civilizations you know is coming in some it, it, to some degree um it it doesn't uh, not all of it is a linear story. You've got bits and fragments of, of different stories that are going on in it. I enjoy that style of storytelling. Um, I, don't, I don't need uh, a, 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 a necessarily always a cohesive um, story or, or, or plot line. It, it, it can diverge or have different fragments going on as long as I feel comfortable in the fact that at some point those are going to you know, tie together in, in some way or whatever. There, there are a couple things in the book that I, I did find confusing. Um, there's a scene with um, kind of a long distance shootout between some characters who we don't know why that shooting was going on really. And then we come to find out that they actually know each other and are part of the same traveling party. That's, that's a, a bit confusing, but doesn't, but doesn't, doesn't give it to us in a way that makes it feel like it's a mystery that that whereas I don't know the answers to everything because obviously I don't want to know the answers to everything in issue one um, but leaves it as some sort of a mystery or a question for me wanting to uh, read it there's that piece of it there's some really interesting characters I think in here these minstrels one of them is a is a um, is a girl who wears a, a, a cloak of vulture feathers she's just a really I, I think interesting character um, and and just really odd. I the love the feel and the tone of her and the book. You, you've got this blind man who we do get a, a a piece of information on him as far as you know why he's blind. He he's not uh, you know his, his eyes are damaged in some fashion, but he's not blind blind it seems. Um, and something blinded him, but it's not the damage to his eyes that hurts. It's what he saw hurts. Um, so there's all that, you know, to curious what there is. We've got this kind of female, seemingly either bounty hunter or she's out for this relic portfolio thing that, um, our vulture, um, cloaked girl has stolen off of, um, some, uh, gunman and, um, this character named Big Alice, this female, you know, gunslinger is out for. Um, and of course we get this kind of legend of, of, of where Lady Death comes from, this, this daughter of death comes from and whatnot. There, it, the way it's told, the origin of her, it's told in kind of a sing-songy rhyme kind of a thing. And it, it may not be the greatest of, of poetical rhyming. Um, uh, I don't know that it needed to be, um solely because it's being told, this whole thing's being told through a, um, um, you know, these minstrels of sorts. I don't know that they are Shakespeare, so I don't know that it had to be written like Shakespeare or in Shakespearean in, in um, quality. Um, but but I, I can see the criticism there. I mean, it wasn't, you know, the most brilliant of stuff, but it conveys quite well I thought the story of of this woman who death falls in love with and they have a child and, and, and the stuff is there um, the art is the biggest the biggest um, attractor for the thing it is an absolutely gorgeous book like I said um, I love the fact that all the people look different from each other um, talking about the art um, there's some nakedness in here the naked women that are in it look like real you know, naked women, not toothpicks or any of that sort of stuff. Um, lots of different body gym, body imagery in it. Um, quite enjoyed that. Love the setting. Um, so yeah, I'm really enjoying the book. I mean, is it like the most best thing ever? No, 
Um, I think it's very solid though. I think there's lots of story ideas and lots of beats that they're gonna be able to do lots of stuff with. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I mean, you know, full disclosure, I am a big um, <clears throat> kind of weird Western uh, kind of a fan anyway, and this of course falls into that into that category for me. Uh, but I, just, I, I mean, I enjoyed the story. I thought the story was was solid. Uh, first issue to give us glimpses of what what we can possibly have going forward. Um, it, it had some whimsy into it. It had some really harsh stuff in it, and the art is just. I cracked it open and immediately thought of the wonderful old school Vertigo books that I used to really, really enjoy all the time. And so um, I'm on board. Next up, a completely different um, <laughs> kind of comic, Samurai Jack issue one. Um, big fan of the TV show when the Samurai Jack TV show was, a, was about. Um, so I was excited to pick this up. I'm going to pick it up for a while just because it's fun. This first issue was fun. We, we get the overlying storyline of what Jack is up to. Of course, you know, he's always trying to figure out how to get himself um, back, in his, back in his own time. And, um, it, you know, in, in this, he's looking for these uh, threads of time that he can put back together to make a rope of time and take the rope of time and, and use the rope of time to get himself back in his own um, in his own um, uh, timeline, um, so that's great. We get the overall story, and of course, it 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 reads like the TV show. If you like the TV show, it's really fun. Um, the art in it is great. It doesn't quite have the quality that I thought the TV show do, did. One of the things I loved about the TV show is you you'd have these. It always seemed like you'd have what felt like long panoramic scenes of just the environment that he was in, uh, which always really impressed me because they were always usually quiet moments of, of these kind of two-dimensional, oddly colored um, background stuff. Not quite as strong in this, but still really great um, and still lots of fun if you just want a, if you dig Samurai Jack, um, you know, it's here and it's great. Lots of fun. Lastly, for this time, we're gonna talk about Sex Criminals Issue 2. Um, uh, in the first issue, of course, it, it kind of was the origin story of the female character of this, her coming to terms of her, her sexuality, um, going in, you know, into puberty and, and, and all of the stuff that goes along with that whole confusing thing in a young woman's life. And then, of course, her also having these powers on top of that, which, of course, makes things even confuser, more confusing. In this one... We get John, I'm pretty sure the character's name is John, we get John's um, origin story of sorts of how he came to where he's at and whatnot. And it's completely different, um, it kind of a book as far as, as, far as for, for his perspective. Uh, probably very smart of them to do her perspective first. Her perspective is very sensitive and whatnot. Not that his isn't, but his comes from a definite male adolescent um, world um, where... Um, you know, not to say that this is stereotypical of every guy, but bits and pieces of it, I think, are. I think they, I think Matt Fraction does a good job of portraying that kind of the juvenility of of it. Um, that whereas there are parts of it for him that are serious, there's also this whole, you know, porn aspect, uh, you know, to it that you know males are more visual, you know, supposedly. So it, it's all about, you know getting it, seeing it, and, and, and whatever. I really liked his perspective from, from him. Yeah, he knew about sex. He, he knew it was this thing, but he didn't understand what the thing was. He thought that it, was, that, that it wasn't the sex itself. It was a matter of having the sex, and then be able to say, afterwards, I had the sex. And, it, and, and what was great for adults, supposedly, about it was, was the after, you know, I've had sex kind of a thing. Not that the sex itself was what it was. I think that was a really interesting part of it to kind of give us a... A perspective on on him and his take and his thinking as a child, uh, uh, you know, and, and you know, just seeing puberty, what that was about. Uh, we get some of the stereotypical stuff that you know, the obsession with porn to some degree, because of course that's the safe place to get the looks at the stuff that that males visually want. 
Um, and it was before the internet age, so there was, or, or the, the beginning of the internet age, so they didn't really have access. You know, it shows them attempting, uh, him and his friends attempting to get access at like the library, which of course has enough filters to block all that kind of fun stuff out. And, um, you know, just different odd little aspects and whatnot. And of course, his version of everything is really crude. One of the things I thought was pretty funny is, of course, her version of when their power goes off, she refers to it as the quiet. It's kind of this kind of romantic, poetic kind of a thing. For him, he referred to it as come world. Um, you know, based off of a porn star, porn store, that once he realized that when he climaxed, um, time would stop. Of course, so then obsessed with the whole sex is what caused time to stop, he would then hit this porn shop. And and so he refers to it embarrassingly. I mean, to some degree, that's what he referred to as. And of course, she's grossed out by it being called cum world. That for her, that's just gross. And there's these great moments in there where she's like, she's like, you know, she's thinking, oh, this guy, you know, I mean, he's, you know, there's some of this aspect that I just don't care for. I don't really want to be, you know, you get the kind of impression that maybe she doesn't want to be attached to anybody. She doesn't really want a boyfriend. But at the same time, he says stuff that makes her go, oh, this guy, you know, so they get these great panels. For one moment, she's like, oh, this guy, repelled in some sense. And then the next moment, oh, this guy. And she's holding his hand and is generally, I think, happy to have found somebody that at least in some sense shares the same um, shares the same world that she does. I mean, she's unique, and part of her is like, "Oh, I'm not unique anymore." But at the same time, it's still really unique in the fact that she, this is the only other person she knows that shares the same thing, the same thing that happens. Whereas their their origin stories may be different and how they came to where they're at, but they do share this bond in this thing that they have together. Um, which I, I think is a unique experience for both of them, it, you know, and whatnot. And then we have the over part of the book, the fact they are uh, robbing a bank in this. And um, very interestingly, there is a group of people, three people it looks like, who um, aren't stopped by time. They are functioning just fine when they, when they go to the quiet or come world, whichever you want to call it. Um, and they're coming into the bank to get them as they're trying to rob the bank. And, and he's wanting to go forward with, heck, we're here, let's just rob the bank. And, and she's like, I, this is a bad idea, let's just, let's just call it quits and be done. So, um, it, really interesting. I'm really enjoying the book. I, I think it still has lots of charm, whereas the first issue was very sweet and her, where hers comes from, this is a more, more juvenile, childish where it all comes from. And... I guess there's a difference in, in experiences and whatnot. I don't know that, that, that the writer is necessarily saying that these are, other than their powers, are standard places where males and females come from on these things. Um, just that these are where these people come from and they have different experiences, not the same experience. Because I think we all, to some degree, have different experiences. We got down to the nitty gritty of telling our own stories, which please let's not, of, of, um, of, how we came to discover the stuff that we discovered, um, that, um, you know, we're all going to have odd, it's all going to be odd in our own way. And then obviously how we as people go about telling it is also going to, um, you know, dictate on whether that sounds potentially juvenile or, you know, or kind of a sweet coming to age, the last issue was. Really curious to see where it goes now, because um, we've really solidly introduced these two characters. I think to a large degree, we've kind of gotten their origin story of how they've come to where they're at now. So excited to see what's going forward um, in the book. Just really enjoying it. You know, completely different kind of a thing. Um, if in any way talking about sex or whatever um, is not your cup of tea or you're uncomfortable with it, don't pick this book up. Um, if you're just kind of willing to explore what's out there um, in the world of comics, telling different kinds of stories that aren't necessarily... Um, biographical in, in nature, but have that kind of a feel to them. You know, this could be your kind of a thing with a little bit of whimsy on the side. Um, pretty cool. That's it this week. Um, next week should have awesome books. We're talking Saga. We're talking Sandman back after 25 years. Um, uh, five Ghosts goes um, ongoing. 
Um, so there's going to be some great No Capes books coming out in this next week. Um, so I will see you with another No Capes next week. Have a good one, everybody.